Thanks. First of all, welcome to one and all. We're so glad to have you here. I'm so excited about this whole concept. And part of the reason that I'm excited is because of our presenter who um, has uh, shared with us through our conversations what ranked choice voting would be. I've also heard Rebecca from Fairboat, Illinois, Fairboat, Illinois give a presentation. <laughs> Rebecca will be around um, to answer questions to encourage you to get involved in whatever way also. Some housekeeping before we begin. Um, we want you all to receive an experience of ranked choice voting. And so consequently, we have, uh, we have sample candidates out here. Um, you will have to vote by QR code. And uh, that's gonna be the only way we can vote tonight. It is so realistic that it will not allow us to pretend we are someone else and enter in paper ballots. That's a good thing. Um, if you, uh, let's see. And those people that are online will have an opportunity to vote because in the middle of our presentation, Donna's gonna flash a QR code on the screen and your phone can take a picture of that. You can then um, vote from home too. We'll take a little break in between and by the end of the presentation, we'll have tallied the results, which is also exciting. You'll see how it works. Um, our speaker tonight is Donna Limper. Donna is team member for the DuPage County chapter of Represent Us. It's the nation's largest grassroots, cross-partisan anti-corruption movement. Donna also serves as co-president for her local League of Women Voters and for the Illinois League of Women Voters, she is the money in politics and ethics specialist for the Issues and Advocacy Committee. In those capacities, she follows communications from multiple organizations, including, but not, uh, not only, Represent Us, the League, Declaration for American Democracy, National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers, Common Cause, Public Citizen, and the rest. Um, too many to mention. In December 2019, she accepted a Citizen Initiative Award from Citizen Advocacy Center for her work in advocating for the improved ethics for DuPage County elected officials. Ms. Limper has an undergraduate degree in business administration from the University of Illinois and has a Master of Management from Northwestern's J.L. Kellogg Graduate School of Management with concentrations in marketing, finance, and business policy she has a second Master of Arts in Education from National Lewis University, and professionally, she has worked in financial research, public relations, nonprofit fundraising, and education. I have found Donna to be both convinced and convincing. I hope all of you will be engaged as well. Donna. Good evening. Welcome to the League of Women Voters of Aurora's Right Choice Voting presentation. I'm going to start by recommending a book. It's called The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. Is that better? Uh, and I can speak louder. Uh, its authors, Catherine Gell, a former CEO, and Michael Porter, who's a Harvard Business School professor, believe the two-party system is failing America. They believe our political duopoly is focused on protecting itself, that major party candidates are chosen to appeal to their party's extremes because extreme voters are those most likely to vote in primaries, in addition, our election system inhibits competition. Third party candidates and independents face enormous hurdles just to get on the ballot. That process tends to produce candidates who are either beholden to their special interests or who support their party's most extreme views. The authors assert the two parties differentiate themselves by competing intensely on tribal ideology and not on solutions. Bipartisan compromise has become a dirty practice. Given that voters consistently list the economy as a top priority, 
This two-party system they believe is dragging our nation down on many economic measures. Gell and Porter do not the, believe the problem is Democrats or Republicans or even political parties per se. They believe the root cause of our political system failure is a lack of competition. They recommend some promising reforms that are already gaining traction. Restructure the election process, restructure the governing process, reform money and politics, and open near-term competition without waiting for the above because defending democracy is urgent. Altogether, these reforms can ensure our politics better serve the public interest and successfully address our nation's problems. The reform we'll be focusing on in this presentation is an element of restructuring the election process, ranked choice voting. Our current choose one system is known as plurality voting. Plurality voting undermines representative democracy by allowing candidates without majority support to win elected office. After an election, have you ever wondered, how did that candidate win? It also limits competition and therefore voter choice. Have you ever felt like you had to vote for the lesser of two evils? It raises concerns about electability. Did you ever wish you could vote for a candidate that does represent you but you fear doing so would help elect someone you actively oppose. Last, it encourages polarizing party over country messaging and negative campaigning. Did you ever wish candidates would stop attacking each other and just discuss solutions to the issues? To understand race choice voting, here are some basics. Ranked choice voting allows voters to rank candidates in order of preference, first, second, third, and so on. Its purpose is to ensure the election of a candidate with majority support whenever you have a race with two or more candidates. It's also known as instant runoff voting, or sometimes you might've heard it called preferential voting. It has been in use in other Western democracies, including India, New Zealand, Ireland and Australia. In fact, both Ireland and Australia have used preferential voting for over a century. Of note, ranked choice voting is the fastest growing nonpartisan voting reform in the nation. Ranked choice voting is best understood by viewing a video. So I'm going to play that now. We're going to go through some ranked choice voting pros. Ranked choice voting has many benefits. First and foremost, it ensures election winners have majority support. It encourages more candidates to run, thereby increasing competition. It produces greater civility in campaigning. It mitigates against extreme candidates in both parties. It allows voters to convey their true preferences without worrying about whether their candidate is electable. It leads to a greater emphasis on voters and policies. This combination of increased competition, reduction in negative campaigning, and greater emphasis on true preferences for both candidates and policies can reduce special interest influence. Last, it can eliminate runoff elections and boost voter turnout. We'll examine some of these pros in more detail so you can fully understand them. Here are some real life examples of candidates winning without majority support in plurality elections. In the 2014 gubernatorial primary, Governor Rauner was chosen as the Republican candidate with only 40% of the votes. In the 2018 Democratic gubernatorial primary, Governor Pritzker was chosen with only 45% of the vote. In both of these cases, if we had redistributed lower ranking candidates, that could have changed the outcome. 
ranked choice voting restores representative democracy by absolutely ensuring majority support for candidates. The plurality system impedes competition in several ways. One is by discouraging spoilers from running. In the 1992 presidential election, Ross Perot was considered a spoiler for Republicans. In 2000, Ralph Nader was considered a spoiler for Democrats. Another problem is that a spoiler can be deliberately introduced. There is little information on the new No Labels Party in the upcoming 2024 presidential election. In a close presidential contest, it can serve as a spoiler for Democrats or Republicans, depending on the candidate and their platform. Ranked choice voting ensures a winner has majority support and encourages more candidates to run by eliminating this spoiler effect. They'll say, don't run because you'll be a spoiler, you know. Ranked choice voting also promotes competition by eliminating vote splitting concerns. Vote splitting occurs in election when you have many candidates. We want many candidates, but watch this for a plurality. In a crowded field, a winner with little support can be elected because 60, 70, or even 80% of the votes are scattered among lots of these other candidates. This was a central problem in the 2019 Chicago mayoral election. There was a total of 14 candidates uh, on the ballot, and that was the most candidates ever in the history of Chicago mayoral elections. Only two of those candidates moved to a runoff election, but neither received more than 20% of the vote in the first round. Lori Lightfoot received only 18% of those votes, and Tony Preckwinkle received only 16% of the votes. Ranked choice voting can uncover true voter preferences. Also in that election, I mean, as you note, like the runoff you know, um, election voter turnout was very low for that. So that's another issue that ranked choice voting works on. So ranked choice voting can inject greater civility into political campaigns. In a plurality system, your best strategy isn't to look good, but to make your opponent look worse. So rather than discuss issues, it is very effective to paint your opponent as unqualified, corrupt, immoral, or even dangerous to our way of life. Ranked choice voting incentivizes candidates to build broad coalitions and reach out to other candidate supporters to be their second choice. This is a quote from former mayor Betsy Hodges who ran for Minneapolis mayor under a ranked choice voting system. There was relatively little elbowing and attacking because every candidate wanted to be the second choice of their opponent's supporters. Virginia offers a very unique comparison opportunity between plurality voting and ranked choice voting. In Virginia, each congressional district party committee can choose its own method of candidate nomination. So Republicans in Virginia's seventh congressional district chose plurality voting. So that's the one on the left there. Republicans in the neighboring 10th congressional district chose ranked choice voting. A comparison study funded by the Center for Campaign Innovation reported these key findings. The Republican nominee in Congressional District 10, selected by ranked choice voting, had a higher net favorable image, up 78, compared to only up 51 for the Republican Congressional District that used plurality voting. The study also examined campaign civility. 84% of the voters in Congressional District 10 said the Republican Republican candidates ran a somewhat or mostly positive campaign compared to only 59% in the seventh district. As I mentioned earlier, the plurality partisan primary system is a big driver of polarization. Primaries tend to have low voter turnout. They also have a greater percentage of extremists who vote in them. 
But even in nonpartisan races, when candidates don't need a majority support to win, they can choose to focus only on a small base of supporters. Ranked choice voting introduces more nuanced choices, breaks the two-party duopoly, and can encourage cross-party cooperation for second preferences. Most important, ranked choice voting holds a strong appeal for independent voters, which is the fastest growing segment of voters in the US. This is particularly true for youth voters, a majority of whom declare themselves to be independent. Sometimes I've seen, and maybe you know this too, like it can be as many as 60% of young voters do not want to choose either political party. Um, they're not happy with them. And so they don't want to decide. They, they vote candidate, they vote policies, and there's certain things that they vote for. So that's kind of a sea change in the different generational voting um, preferences. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the cons. Ranked choice voting is not a cure-all for what ails our democracy, and it does have some cons that need to be considered. First, it requires a significant investment in voter education up front, something that the league can provide. Second, it requires voters to be more informed about candidates, something the league's Vote 411 one-stop election shop can provide, or the Illinois Voter Guide. There's lots of candidate voter guides out there, so that's not an um, insurmountable obstacle. The remaining hurdles are more significant. First is the cost of voting machines or software updates. Plus, there is an increased training and workload for election clerks and volunteers. In addition, ranked choice voting can result in longer wait times for election results, which can increase distrust in elections which is already an issue for some voters. Last, it can generate intense frustration from non-majority former plurality winners who suddenly cannot win under a majority system. While this is not a con in my mind, it can generate well-funded mis- and disinformation <coughs> campaigns from extremist and special interest groups who might lose under the system. Let's look at the capital costs of implementation in Illinois. Amber McReynolds is a senior political strategist with issue one, and she believes if ranked choice voting legislation passed in Illinois, it could be quickly implemented. She reports that more than 80% of Illinois voters live within a jurisdiction that has the systems and the software to use ranked choice voting. However, more than a third of Illinois counties would require updates with particular cost concerns for rural counties. Julie Biss, Boone County clerk, estimates the capital expense for Boone County to purchase the needed software upgrade. They have the election equipment, they need the software upgrade, ranges from 35,000 to 45,000. Sangamon County Clerk Don Gray estimates an upgrade to the county's election systems and software would cost about 1.8 million. So they need both, they need new equipment, they need new software. In addition, every Illinois county has a separate contract with voting companies. Other states such as Vermont, Georgia, Rhode Island have statewide contracts that reduce costs and give voters a more uniform experience across the state. Operating and administrative costs. In a 2019 survey published in the Election Law Journal, municipal clerks in Maine were asked about the administrative burden of running a ranked choice voting election. Almost two thirds of the clerks said ranked choice voting increased their administrative burden but the responses were partisan. About half of the Democratic clerk respondents noticed an increased burden compared to 83% of Republican clerk respondents. Increased operating costs included printing costs because your ballots are gonna be larger and the cost of educating the public and election volunteers. They also mentioned an increased burden in programming and testing voting equipment before election day. 
Last, Maine's mixed ballot also complicated matters because their statewide and federal races are decided with ranked choice voting, but their municipal and state legislative races are decided by plurality voting. Some clerks therefore had to use like two different methods to tabulate their votes. The takeaway here is that implementation challenges should not prevent ranked choice voting, but that implementation must be well thought out. Most importantly, experts must be called on to assist county and municipal clerks in the transition. Remember too that any new system has a learning curve. A lot of these costs are upfront costs and they diminish as time goes on and people get used to the system. Ranked choice voting detractors claim that ranked choice voting is too complicated for voters to understand, but research has proven that claim to be false. In the New York City 2021 mayoral election, 95% of voters found the ballot simple to complete and ease of use was reported across all demographics. Other first time ranked choice voting cities also had high percentages of voters citing ease of use. Importantly, as I mentioned, voter understanding goes up even more in subsequent elections because of that learning curve. Another criticism is that ranked choice voting hurts candidates of color. However, research has shown that representation for both candidates of color and women has grown in communities that implemented ranked choice voting. A 2021 study by Fair Vote, Rebecca, <laughs> looked at how voters of various races and ethnicities interact with ranked choice voting elections. Winning, ca winning candidates of color grew their vote total between rounds at a higher rate than winning white candidates. Voters of color tend to rank more candidates than white, can white voters. Candidates of color see the strongest gains in districts with a majority of voters of color. And ranked choice voting prevents vote splitting among candidates of color. Now it's time to try it out. Ranked Choice Voting 123 is a free nonprofit ranked choice voting education site that we'll be using. If you bring out your phone and put your phone up and take a look at this QR code, you will be able to vote for your favorite cookie. So our cookie choices are Oreos, Chips Ahoy, Keebler Fudge Stripes, the animal crackers, and Walker shortbreads. So each of these, you would choose one of them to be your first choice, one to be your second choice, one to be your third choice, one to be your fourth choice, and one to be your fifth choice. I'm gonna give you a moment. Is there anybody in the audience that needs the QR code? <laughs> All right, so um, raise your hand if you found it easy. Raise your hand if you found it hard. Okay, so there we go. Um, okay, where is ranked choice voting used in the U.S.? As of November 2023, 50 American jurisdictions had ranked choice voting in place. This includes two states, Maine and Alaska, three counties and 45 cities. A 2024 ballot initiative has been filed in Colorado to adopt a top four open primary system and ranked choice voting in general elections. If approved, the constitutional amendment would take effect in 2026. Military and overseas voters cast ranked choice voting ballots in federal runoff elections in six states. Hawaii uses ranked choice voting for its special elections. In Illinois, we use ranked choice voting in Springfield for overseas and military voters. And ranked choice voting recently passed in Evanston 
for use in local elections there. Let's keep Evanston in mind for later. Can I add to that? Sure. Um, ranked choice voting is also going to, in addition to Colorado, it's also going to be on the ballot in Nevada and Oregon mm -hmm. this November. So that's, that's fantastic. Three states. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Anything else to add there? Oh, it's an update. Okay. Um, so some organizations characterize ranked choice voting as a leftist reform. However, um, the National Council of State Legislators could not identify any research expressly analyzing whether ranked choice voting benefits one political party or another. There are so many factors, including the candidates, you know, the makeup, whether you have a, a percentage of independence, you know, who makes up, you have a lot of young people. So there's so many factors, it's really hard to sort of decide one way or the other with that. It would have to be a completely broad-based research. But an academic paper from Maine does provide some insight into this prejudice. In their analysis of Maine 2020 federal elections, scholars Joseph Cerrone and Cynthia McClintock found the Maine Republican Party and its voters were highly dissatisfied with ranked choice voting. They noted that Maine had a long history of Republican plurality winners because minor party candidates typically receive a, sh a significant share of votes in that state. Because ranked choice voting would allow these third party voters to cast a second choice for Democrats, the system in that state could be seen as more beneficial to Democrats than Republicans in the state of Maine. Despite a lack of research, red states like Florida and Tennessee have banned ranked choice voting. And in 2023, the Illinois Opportunity Project launched the Stop Ranked Choice Voting Coalition in our state. The Illinois Opportunity Project is a free market advocacy organization founded by John Tillman, chair of the Libertarian and Conservative Illinois Policy Institute. There were several ranked choice voting bills introduced in the 103rd General Assembly. Uh, the first one focuses on presidential primaries the second, HB and SB, proposed ranked choice voting for Illinois executive offices in the General Assembly. And the third one focuses on ranked choice voting for municipal and township offices. None of these bills moved out of committee. However, a 2023 election omnibus bill passed and it created a ranked choice voting task force. The task force will talk with election officials, interest groups, and the public about adopting and implementing ranked choice voting for the 2028 presidential primary. The task force is expected to publish a final report of its findings and recommendations by March of this year. Is that still true, Ms. Varjano? Um, so meetings just started with the task force. Mm -hmm. They're having their second one this Friday. Okay. Uh, if the meetings go as is currently scheduled, they go through the end of March so we'd be expecting the result in like April or the report in April or May. So still spring, yeah. spring of 2024. Yeah. Okay. Home rule municipalities can adopt ranked choice voting now with a binding referendum. In November of 22, Evanston became the first city in Illinois to pass ranked choice voting. Voters decided to adopt the new election system with over 82% of the vote. Oak Park, Chicago, Naperville, Bloomington, and Normal all currently have ranked choice voting initiatives. Given the ranked choice voting task force's focus on presidential primaries, let's learn more about that. The 2020 Democratic presidential primary was crowded and competitive. So was the Republican presidential primary from 2016. When you have so many candidates, ranked choice voting in presidential primaries is the best system to produce a broadly supported nominee worthy of representing the party in the general election. 
We should also understand that plurality voting produces the greatest number of wasted votes. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but a wasted vote is any vote that does not receive representation in the final election outcome. For example, if you vote for a candidate who drops out before the primary election, your vote was wasted. Ranked choice voting is currently used to choose a presidential nominee in Alaska, Hawaii, <coughs> Kansas, Nevada, Wyoming, Democratic primaries. Ranked choice voting falls under and is supported by the League of Women Voters U.S. representation electoral systems position. The League cannot advertise for something unless it thoroughly researches the pros and cons and then takes a consensus position by a, a majority vote of its members. In addition, eight state leagues have adopted specific ranked choice voting positions. League recommended best practices for adoption include strong voter education on using a ranked choice voting ballot, voting ballots that are easily understood, ranked choice voting ballots that include an allowance for write-in candidates, voting equipment that is fully capable to handle ranked choice voting, and the use of proportional ranked choice voting for multi-winner elections. So here's a look at an official ranked choice voting ballot from the 2020 general election in Maine. So you can see what an actual ranked choice voting ballot looks like. So this was a real ballot used in, a, in the election in Maine. You can see in terms of the league's preferences, the, the write-in space, which we believe is important. Where is the write-in space? I guess maybe on the bottom. Okay. Yeah. It's very small, yeah. So you can come up and see it later. Let's learn about proportional ranked choice voting. Gerrymandering and safe seats are the biggest threat to democracy. Proportional ranked choice voting is one solution to lessen the influence of gerrymandering. When Democrats live overwhelmingly in cities and Republicans overwhelmingly live in the exurbs, the only competitive districts tend to be those at the boundaries. This makes gerrymandering very easy. 2021 research from Cornell University found that ranked choice multi-member districts blunt gerrymandering. By creating larger multi-member districts, the voting method improves both political and demographic representation in legislatures. Some form of proportional ranked choice voting is used in most advanced democracies, excluding the US. The Fair Representation Act was first introduced in Congress in 2017. It has been reintroduced and calls for instituting proportional ranked choice voting for US House elections. So another video best demonstrates proportional ranked choice voting, which would be used both to blunt gerrymandering in state and federal legislative races, which I just discussed, but it would also be used in multi-winner municipal races. So, um, you know, if we're discussing Naperville in, um, in DuPage County, and of course, when you, when you vote in Naperville, you're voting for more than one candidate because you have representation of maybe, I think it's three at a time, is that correct? Three four. Four, yeah, four at a time, a, sorry, yeah, I don't live there. But... member at large council. Gotcha, okay. So uh, we're gonna watch this video now. Give me a second, okay. Fair Vote is a nonpartisan organization that promotes ranked choice voting and the Fair Representation Act. Fair Vote Illinois recently launched a DuPage chapter in DuPage County. The chapter is led by Joe Cardinal and Samra Syed. Here today is Rebecca. I forgot your last name, Rebecca. Uh, Williams. Williams. Rebecca Williams. She is an organizer for Fair Vote Illinois. The goal is to educate and advocate for ranked choice voting. The initial focus is on bringing ranked choice voting to Naperville municipal elections. If you want to help advance this reform in the far west suburbs, here's how you can help. You can join the Fair Vote to Page email list. Rebecca will be passing around a um, clipboard. 
You can follow DuPage uh, Fair Vote on Facebook and Instagram. You can volunteer for tabling events, put up flyers, or recommend presentations to other organizations so they could learn more and decide for themselves if they want to support this election reform. Fair Vote DuPage County is here tonight. This is Rebecca, and you can sign up for all those things or even just speak to her to learn more. I'd like to end the presentation on an implementation note. Represent Us, that's the organization that I volunteer with, Democracy Rising and the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center partnered to create a new resource guide to help advocates implement ranked choice voting smoothly. It contains resources for voter and candidate education, communications, and technical implementation. Equally important, it shares information on both political and legal defense. When a particular political group loses in the political arena or incumbents of either party are threatened by the reform, they become fierce opponents of ranked choice voting. Once adopted, ranked choice voting advocates should be prepared for attempts to delay and undermine the law's implementation or to repeal it altogether. In Cook County, election clerk Karen Yarbrough is raising concerns that might delay implementation of ranked choice voting. Is that still going on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know that we've gotten any actual concerns raised, but- <laughs> There is an <laughs> implementation saying, delay. Should we just yeah, leave it at that? Yeah, okay. yeah, they're just saying, we don't know if we're going to do this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so hence the problem, hence the, the paper. Uh, discussions are underway. This document can be very helpful in identifying and addressing implementation issues that translate to a successful implementation and a positive public perception of ranked choice voting. So you might want to hand this and get some lawyers on your side there. Um, so there's a lot of money behind this so uh, that, that you could get help from. So I highly recommend it. Um, represent us, as you know, gave $10,000 to the Evanston Initiative, and um, I know we can put money behind a legal defense to help you implement it. So anyway, that's it. Are there any questions? Rebecca, you want to come up here and ask sure. questions? Yes. I have maybe you can explain this at the mm -hmm. very start, but I can see how this works in our current system. Yes. I can see how it works in a primary if there's more than two candidates. Right. But how does it work when there are only two candidates? Oh, you don't use it when there's only two oh, candidates. Okay. Yeah, okay. because there's nobody to rank. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Because, because they use it in general elections, and usually by the time you get to the general election, in most places it's narrowed down to two. Right. So it's only used if there are multiple Yes, candidates. yeah. Now, once you start adopting ranked choice voting, you know, because you're eliminating the spoiler effect and it does encourage more people to run because I think the spoiler effect really prevents a lot of people from running. I know uh, we had, uh, I know I spoke with a libertarian gentleman at, the, at a fair vote meeting and he was feeling like he never could really run because the Republican party was discouraging him from running because they were telling him he couldn't possibly win, you know. Um, and, you know, and that might happen in either party. I'm not picking on the Republican Party, but you know what I mean? But just that was his experience uh, telling, telling me that. Um, Represent Us tends to come from more of like a, an independent, um, was started by independents who couldn't get on the ballot. So that's why. So then in a primary, if there were only two candidates running in the primary, Well, no, because you, yeah, you, there's nothing to rank. You're choosing one or the other. Yeah. So you can have a case where you would be using both rank choice and or what you call the other choice. plurality, plurality. Or, or traditional. You could call it traditional voting. Okay, yeah. Traditional voting mm -hmm. in the same election, depending on the race. Yeah. Okay, so it depends on the race. Yeah. Okay. That's what they were saying in Maine, you know, had these mixed ballots because they only use ranked choice voting in some races and not in others. And if I may say to that, Here, I actually don't know if I, yeah. 
Sorry. That's all right. Um, what's kind of nice for Illinois in terms of like that issue that they experience in Maine is uh like it or not, our municipal elections are on a different cycle than the general elections. So for any places where we're getting um, ranked choice voting for municipal elections, which is the main thing Fairboat Illinois is focused on at the moment, that's going to be on its own like April ballot. So you're not going to have that kind of split with the general November elections or for the March primary elections or anything like that. Yeah. 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 That's okay. I have a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. With great choice voting, if you have three candidates yes. in the race and I vote, but I only vote for one candidate, does that screw the count? No, it just means that you only voted for that one candidate. But if does your that, candidate that, does that candidate, does that give that candidate more of an advantage? No, no, it does not. There's no bullet voting on this. Yeah. Bullet voting can work if you don't have ranked choice voting. Um, so yeah, no, it doesn't help. But but then if your candidate that you chose, if there's three candidates and you're only voting for one and that's the one that get eliminated, you didn't get a choice between the other two. It behooves you to rank, you know, all of them. Yeah. Yes. Oh, two questions. The first one, um, so in the primary mm -hmm. in Illinois, you have to your party because there's two separate ballots. Right. So you might have two right. or four presidents on the Democratic side, two uh, for president on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. With ranked choice voting, would you just get one ballot? Everyone just gets the same ballot and you have four? It depends on the state. Okay. So there's another, so Represent Us also advocates for open primaries. Oh. Illinois is a partially open, meaning that I could say I'm a Democrat one year, and then I could say I'm a Republican another year, and I could choose my ballot, right? So that's called partially open. But a truly open means your Democrats and your Republicans are on the same ballot, and you're ranking them whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. And that rate of uh, rate choice voting wouldn't eliminate that? You would still get two separate ballots? It, it, again, it depends on the state. It's it's a completely separate. Yeah, it's a completely separate thing. If I yeah, go ahead. if I could say with this, um, so there are multiple states right now looking to implement a final four or a final five system with open primaries. Um, that's what we're currently seeing in Alaska. Uh, now you're never going to see that with the president. Uh, because that's just a different system. But the final four, final five, that works great for like congressional seats, right? Or um, or could even work for state legislative seats. Um, but we just don't think that's ever going to be a true possibility in Illinois because we're a legislative state. And that's a pretty high bar to convince state legislators that they should vote for something that's going to make it so they have more competition every election <laughs> every election uh they really like that right now when they're in a safe district they're in a safe district and they have basically no competition open primaries with final four introduces more competition which is great but where you're seeing that reform actually take hold is in the ballot initiative states and, and it's not just the ballot initiative states. It tends to pop up in states that have a high percentage of independent voters. Oh, yeah. And so that's where it gets the most. Like Alaska has a high percentage of independent voters. And that's, same with Nevada. And same with Nevada. And so those are the ones that are kind of, um, what is it, pioneering, would you say, or spearheading yeah, yeah. the open primary system. So again, each state, we're very decentralized in the United States with our election systems. And so... You know, each state is kind of, we're experimenting with a lot of different things right now because we're not really happy with what we've got. So um, so different states are experimenting with different things. And again, it's so different because each state has a different makeup of voters and preferences and candidates. And so it's very hard to generalize. I'm, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Or? Okay. Sure. In the example that we have when we were watching the video, yeah. we had purple and orange. And the first purple hit their 25%. Right. So they took 10% and moved it to, to two other candidates. Right. How did you determine which 10% you took? 
You took the second choice. The second choice, yeah. So how did you determine? Because I'm assuming that if you have all of these different choices or first choice, they might all have different second choice. Right. So did you take that? Yeah. yeah. You want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. 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 Great question. So um, it, it used to be when we counted the ballots by hand, uh, which is what they've done in Cambridge, Massachusetts, since like the 40s, they've had ranked choice voting for that long. Um, it, they would randomize it. So if you had, you know, 500 more votes than needed, you would randomly take 500 ballots and distribute the second choice. Now that we have machines that do it, we don't have to do that. What we do is we take, um, we take a, a fraction of the overage. So if they have 25% more votes than needed, then you move 25% of each voter's vote. Yeah, yeah. So it's all the voters that voted for that first purple candidate will get part of their vote move, but it would just be a fraction. Yeah, and I just I kind of want to put it in the context of Illinois. So when you have a plurality system, you have a winner take all system, right? So let's say um, in your uh, represent representative area, when you have this kind of narrow area, um, and let's say it's very like where I live, it's very close. It's like 50 percent Democrats, 50 percent Republican, kind of teeter totters back and forth, usually depending on the candidate. Um, but it's a very close. So anyway, whoever wins that, you generally have 50 percent of the populace that's unhappy. You know what I mean? So if you make this sort of wider distribution, um, and you actually tally like the legislators who represent the people, it generally, this will produce, if you have 60% of the voters who are Republican and 40% who are Democrats, it will generally produce that percentage of representation. And in that sense, it is a better system, which is why it is used in almost every other representative democracy in the world. Okay, it's a great question. Any, any others? You, you mentioned um, several states in Illinois that are considering, you said, an initiative. What do you mean by that? What so do you want to take a picture? Sure. Yeah, so um, for Chicago, I will say, um, in, well, in both Chicago and Bloomington and Normal, uh, those are cities where we're trying to go through the city council to put it on the ballot, which is how we got it in Evanston. Um, and yeah. Donna and represent us were fantastically helpful <laughs> with that Evanston initiative and getting that going. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so in those places, it's about lobbying the city council to put on the ballot. Um, we're hoping for 20, April 2025 for Bloomington and Normal. Um, for Chicago, it's a much larger project. We're hoping for March of 2026 is when we would get that done. Now, um, for this is a more recent one, so we didn't have it up there, but for Oak Park, Skokie, and Naperville, those are all cities where we are doing petition drives. Um, and so that's, you know, get a certain amount of signatures, we'll get it on the ballot. Uh, for Oak Park, we're trying to get it for, Nove for this November's election. For Skokie and Naperville, it would be for April next year. So you get, you get on the ballot and the voters vote for it, but people who are, it might be against their self-interest for it to happen, could block it by delaying things or delaying inflation or delay. Is that possible? Yeah, so the, yeah. the main um, concerns we're looking at right now is um, yeah, the Cook County clerk doesn't seem to be a fan of wanting to implement it. So we're working on that. Um, we haven't talked to represent us yet about um, healthy and legally, but I, I think um, I think we will because, yeah, we'll probably need that. Um, so the county clerks or just or if it's a city election authority, they can be a potential blocker for it. The other thing is, um, and it can be more of a concern with petitions, if there's someone who just wants to challenge it, it, it independently. Um, you get that a lot with petition referenda. Um, so that's just something where we're trying to be really careful about the language so that if someone does challenge it, it can stand up legally. 
I, can we tell if there's any questions from the online audience? I have checked. I have invited questions. We have no questions at this time. Okay, great. Well, if there are no more questions, then we'll be here if you wanted to come up afterwards. Do you, can we see do you want to see oh, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. What am I thinking? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So did that win outright? So this is the round slider, right? So we're gonna go here. Okay. Oops. I think it just went outright. I think it actually it got the amount of votes that he did. Why? Oh, it just yeah, it did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, listen, I have done the same. I've done the same election with kids, and I trust me, walk with short bread does not win with kids. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's the winner. This is what I'm talking about. Candidates and voters matter. With yeah, kids, yeah. this is what wins. <laughs> yeah, so this maybe was a thing. We did this, um, we did this in my league with uh, with beer. And so we did a rank your favorite beer, and we had five flights of taster beers, and um, we had all four rounds. Yeah. You know, a blueberry beer was eliminated in the first round. <laughs> Don't ever order that. It, it's disgusting. <laughs> um, so anyway, so yeah, so I think, you know, I think to get a better demonstration, we have to do something where the race is maybe a little bit closer. So I didn't really think this would well, like, and it's be so popular. Again, it depends on the demographic. I yeah. wouldn't have guessed that would have right. worn out right. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. So, okay, we're all of a certain age. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And that concludes that presentation. Rebecca and I will remain as long as anyone wishes to talk or have any other questions. Thank you so much for taking the time and coming. Thank you.